In this edition, we have a story on Uganda's desperate battle against AIDS. We then go to the Philippines for a report on what businessmen are doing to save the environment. Then on to Honduras, which is fast taking over as the cigar-making capital of the world. We then see how abandoned Chinese orphans are getting a second chance in America, and we end with a story from our very own Uttar Pradesh about the efforts Harijan women are making to improve their lives. Good evening. I'm Tavleen Singh with The World Around Us. In this program, we will bring you stories that go beyond the news, that tell you about things that generally don't get into the news bulletins of the world because they do not constitute what we like to call hard news. We begin with Uganda, where the AIDS virus is believed to have originated, and we see what is being done to contain a disease that has destroyed whole communities and turned once thriving centers into ghost towns. There is a funeral today in the small village of Masaka in the Rakai district of southeastern Uganda. The deceased, Kanuara Ekiganda, a shoemaker. He was 30 years old. In traditional Ugandan culture, when someone dies, the whole village normally turns out for the funeral. The body is wrapped in tree bark, the same thing the Ugandans wore for clothing before the British arrived here at the turn of the century. It represents a kind of going home. During funerals, all work stops as everyone helps prepare food and comfort the relatives of the deceased. Funerals used to be unusual occurrences in the Rakai district. Now, there is one almost every week. Kanuara Ikiganda died of AIDS, and he is not alone. Here, in the southeast corner of Uganda, almost 35% of the population is HIV positive. And here, the disease is not restricted to homosexuals or intravenous drug users. Transmission here is 100% heterosexual. Why has AIDS spread so rapidly here? Part of the reason may be the culture. Jerry Kintunda is the brother of the deceased. According to African tradition, he will now adopt his dead brother's children and marry his dead brother's wife, most likely exposing himself to the AIDS virus. If such a small child loses a father, and the father of this child is my brother, then uh, we, because the, the, this child now becomes the heir, the successor to my brother, then what happens is, because this child is very young, he will come directly under my control and my charge, but then the mother of this child, even if she becomes my wife, I add her to my, to my number. If I was a, a monogamous man, then I will become polygamous. Today, most scientists believe that AIDS originated near here, in this remote section of East Africa. AIDS has been prevalent here longer than anywhere else on Earth, and the course of the disease here may give us some insight into the course the disease will take around the world. Dr. Edward Mbede is an epidemiologist at Malago Hospital in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. Dr. Mbede has spent the past 10 years trying to understand why AIDS is so prevalent in Uganda and how to break the explosion of the epidemic worldwide. What people need to appreciate now, that the AIDS epidemic is a dynamic epidemic. It may move from one population into another population. And I think people globally should put their energies and resources not to think that this route of transmission is not, given the fact that most people worldwide practice heterosexual sex. So any society is vulnerable. If Rakai represents the future, then it is a truly terrible future to behold. This is an orphanage on the outskirts of Massacre. Orphanages used to be virtually unknown in Uganda. In the rare circumstance when both parents might die, the extended family would absorb the children. Today, entire extended families are being wiped out. Almost half the children in the Rakai district are orphans. The Reverend Francis Endowler heads the orphanage. Of the children we have around, yeah. I think it could be over 50. 
Fifty percent are orphans. Over the over the the children who have around. Fifty percent of these children are orphans. Yes, they are either orphans already, or the parents are already down. The impact of the disease can also be seen on the streets of Massacre. This is the main market, once a thriving commercial center. Dr. Jerusi is a local physician. Here, all this trick, formulate used to be stalls, like the other one you can see there. Right. But uh, due to the death rate of the people, the stalls have vanished. In the past five years, more than half the stores in Massacre have closed, their owners dead of AIDS. <laughs> While there is no cure for the disease, a great deal is being done here in Uganda to try and slow its spread. And most of that is in the form of education, trying to change traditional patterns of behavior. But that is not always easy, particularly when the societies are poor and traditional. Outreach workers from TASO, a Uganda AIDS education group, travel the entire country trying to educate people about ways in which the disease is spread. You get the condom at the tip like this, but telling people to use condoms every time they have sex is difficult in a place where the average person has to walk three miles for drinking water each day. The supply of condoms simply does not exist. Tasso may find more success trying to change the traditional practices that are now dangerous. Tribal healers, for example, who use razor blades and blood, have to be educated about the dangers of how the disease is passed on. Perhaps the most successful is this traveling road show about AIDS. It shows how unprotected sex can cause the disease. In a society that is largely illiterate and far removed from radio or television, these passion plays of the 90s can have a strong impact. But for the vast majority of Ugandans, the play's end is no surprise. They have seen this almost every day in real life. Next to the Philippines, where pressures from the global marketplace are forcing local businessmen to adopt cleaner, more environmentally friendly methods of production. When it comes to businessmen, that kind of pressure usually works. This is the Pasig River, the main waterway in downtown Manila. It used to be the city's central artery, a lifeline for shippers, farmers, and fishermen. Yet today, the river is one of the most polluted in Asia. It may seem like a local problem, but the Pasig is part of the global marketplace, and pressure to clean it up could soon be coming from businesses halfway around the world. Until a year and a half ago, this factory on the outskirts of Manila used ozone-depleting chlorofluorocarbons to clean the circuit boards it sent to its overseas buyers. Today, the boards get a water cleaning in this $300,000 machine. The Filipino owners say that the high local cost of CFC solvents was one reason for the investment. But another more urgent reason came from much farther away. The second major factor that drove us to buying this equipment was uh, pressure from our customers. Our customers were requiring us to get out of CFC as fast as we could. And uh, that basically forced us also to consider buying this machine. Those customers, large corporations in the US, Europe, and Japan, were responding to a similar sort of pressure from their customers and shareholders, who are demanding that their products be green all the way back to the source. We ask for three specific things at this point, knowing that we will continue to evolve these expectations. One is that they have an environmental improvement policy endorsed by their top management. Secondly, that they have an environmental improvement plan with metrics. Uh, and third, that they've eliminated ozone-depleting substances from their manufacturing processes. But some Asian businesses say the multinationals should understand the market forces they have to face. They fear that Western standards means higher costs and lower profits. But Western executives pushing for higher standards say good environmental management is good business. Forget about the massive cost of litigation, fines and cleanups. Those are still years away. In most of Asia, simply running a high waste operation means valuable energy and materials are being lost. Environmental performance can be a very expensive proposition, but it doesn't have to be. It isn't always expensive. It doesn't always have to be a major capital drain. In particular, the more a company can focus on prevention, the more a company can work on its management systems, 
it can often find the low-cost way to achieve more, better environmental performance. But electronic assembly is incorporated, replacing imported CFCs with water, lowered the cost of a process that had been costing more and more money. But some smaller companies complain that they can't afford the initial investment. And some governments have objected to what they consider an infringement of sovereignty and a barrier to free trade. Western businesses disagree. I think the most important thing is to work with the companies who are your customers. They don't have an interest in putting you out of business. They prosper by their suppliers being able to deliver dependable products in a dependable way. I think many, many customers will find that they have more to gain by helping their suppliers meet standards than by having their suppliers fall short. But falling short may be more likely under a new set of global industrial standards. Due to be operational in 1996, ISO 14000 won't have any legal status, but it will probably become the environmental yardstick for most of the world's big businesses. The standards are intended to harmonize a dizzying array of national regulations. Writing them has been a highly political process and one that involves few emerging economies. When you have all those important uh, committees chaired by, by the UK, by the Netherlands, Australia, the US, uh, I don't see any <laughs> any committee being chaired by a developing country, and yet the developing countries present peculiar, unique circumstances of their own with respect to environment. Where can you get the additional data on benchmarking? Over the next year or two, Asian companies can expect more invitation to conferences like this one, with American business people sounding the alarm about what's to come. The message is that times are changing and Asia had better be ready. Ever since there have been cigars, they've been synonymous with Havana. But it now seems that Cuba, whose economy is in trouble because of its outdated ideas and resistance to globalization, is being replaced by Honduras as the cigar capital of Latin America. Despite anti-smoking campaigns in the United States, the demand for this particular weed appears to be growing. Cigar connoisseurs say it doesn't get any better than a fragrant hand-rolled Havana. Yet as Cuba's economy falters and the demand for premium cigar soars, the new cigar capital of Latin America is Honduras. Nesta Plancencia is one of Cuba's best cigar makers, lives here, in the remote Honduran town of Dan Lee. He fled Cuba during the revolution in the 1960s and brought with him tobacco seeds and know-how. Honduran soil is nearly identical to the best Cuban tobacco lands, and now Dan Lee's eight factories produce 50 million cigars a year. Success hasn't come easy. After fleeing Cuba, the Placencia family rebuilt their cigar business in Nicaragua. But once again, their lands were confiscated when the Sandinistas took power in 1979. So they fled to Dan Lee, just across the Honduran border. Yet within a few years, the area became a base for Contra guerrillas who launched attacks against the Sandinistas. Many of my colleagues in the cigar business who had left Nicaragua said I was crazy because this was so close to the war. They didn't want anything to do with it after disasters in Cuba and Nicaragua. But at that time, we were much younger and I figured there were a lot of possibilities here. The gamble paid off. The Contra War ended in 1990, just in time for a boom in cigar smoking in the United States. Placencia has the largest factory in the Honduras, and each of his workers rolls up to 500 cigars a day. Top quality cigars, which cost from one to $18 each, have a new sachet in the US. The image of the stale and stinky stooge has been erased by the emergence of glossy magazines like Cigar Aficionado, Victorian Smoking Saloon, and high-profile puffers like comedian David Letterman and President Bill Clinton.
It's also a touch of class at an affordable price, says Luis Montes, a supervisor at Dan Lee's Central America cigarette plant. Good handmade cigar, good, good quality, good tobacco. It's something classy, it's good. It's like a good wine, it's like a good food. It's classy, you know, you buy a cigar for a dollar, a dollar fifty, you're not smoking a... You're smoking good stuff, good things. Yet outside the tobacco factories, this isn't exactly a boomtown. Seventy percent of Hondurans live in poverty, and Danley is no exception. Cigar workers make less than a hundred dollars a month. This barber points out that most of them can't afford to smoke the Churchills and Coronas that they roll. While the cigar industry provides thousands of jobs, some residents say that the economy was in better shape during the Contra War, when the town was swarming with rebels on R and R from the front lines. Others wonder if the cigar fad will prove as fleeting as a whiff of tobacco smoke. While less damaging than cigarettes, cigars have been linked to cancer of the larynx, mouth, esophagus and lungs. The American Cancer Society says that the tobacco industry is promoting cigars to make up for a drop in cigarette sales. Still, managers at the Placencia plant are confident that the new generation of cigar smokers is hooked. China, the most populous country in the world, has for several years now strictly imposed a law that permits only one child per family. The result has been tragic for little girls who find themselves abandoned by parents who want only sons. In this story, we see how there is finally hope for China's abandoned girl child. This little girl is one of the tens of thousands of babies who were abandoned in the streets of China. The country's strict one-child-per-family laws have forced many parents to leave their children on the streets, hoping they'll be saved by an orphanage. But unlike most of her Chinese sisters and brothers, Ellen now lives in America. Sarah Bowman of Atlanta, Georgia, is her mother. The only thing I can say is that it's absolutely the most wonderful thing that has ever happened to me. Like nearly a thousand Americans, Bowman traveled across the globe last year to adopt a Chinese girl. As a single woman in her mid-forties, she was frustrated by America's cumbersome adoption procedures. And at my age, the chances for adoption for a single woman of 44 to adopt in the United States, uh, I mean, they're virtually nil, uh, unless you want to spend an enormous amount of money and go through a lawyer and do a completely open adoption. So she turned to China, which for the last four years has welcomed foreign adoptions. Heino Erickson, who organizes many of these adoptions, says China encourages older people to adopt. I think uh, because age uh, in China, uh, like in many countries of Asia, is, is, uh, is revered, uh, they're not having the youth culture like we have in our country right now. <laughs> Oh, they are. Bowman tried to adopt from Romania, Russia, and from Latin America before she turned to China. There, she spent about $12,000 to get her bouncing baby girl, considerably less than she would have spent in the U.S. And Erickson says Chinese orphanages have what most American families want. They all want girls, and uh, there's really a, uh, a country on earth where the adoption of uh, close to infant girls are um, possible in a, in a brief period of time. Bowman's little girl was found on the streets of Shanghai. Like so many other Chinese baby girls, she was abandoned by parents who either broke China's strict population rules or wanted their only child to be a son to carry on the family name. In patriarchal China, the orphanages are filled with girls. A healthy boy is almost impossible to come by, but there's no dearth of handicapped or sick ones. This little boy has cerebral palsy. He showed up at this orphanage a few months ago with his fingers charred. His father had tried to electrocute him, and he'd put his fingers into a, an electrical point, 
and uh, it had burnt all his fingers, and, but it hadn't killed him, so they uh, abandoned him. Most of the orphanages are overcrowded and underfunded. There's usually no heat or air conditioning, and the rooms reek of urine. <laughs> I'm washing because they are not properly washed. So maybe they haven't washed for about um, more than two weeks. A recent study showed that at the best orphanages in China, only half of the babies survived. Ellen is one of the few lucky ones. Unlike the vast majority of Chinese orphans, she's been given a chance at a second life. While China's family planning regulations have benefited a handful of Western women like Sarah Bowman who want babies, on the other side of the world, those same rules have created a generation of children wanted by no one. Finally, we go to Banda district in Uttar Pradesh, where on account of an extraordinary program called Mahila Samakya, we saw how illiterate Harijan women are emerging as the engine of social change. You may not think it at first glance, but these women, hand pump mechanics, represent nothing short of a revolution in this remote village in Banda, the most backward district in Uttar Pradesh. Till a program called Mahila Samakya, or Education for Women's Equality, came into this area, the women of this village, where the literacy rate is 0.4%, did not step out of their homes. Today, they are responsible for keeping hand pumps in the area functioning. Mahine mo se jada karke do three kharaap hua thi, aur jada nahi kharaap hota. Aur gaon gaon ghum ke ye. Ha gaon 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 ghum ke. Ha. Acha aur isse sikhne se aur ye karne se apki apko kya farak pada hai? Ye ki farak pada di pahile to pani ki hamen bahut taklif rahi hai. Aur jalne ke hamen itta admi kam rahe ki kahan kahan bhag hai. वो तब पूज नहीं पाउत रहे हैं तो ये के कारण हम फिर हम कहन चलो साइत हम जो बाना लगता हम उसी के लागे तो उन हम को बोझ कम मिलते तो फिर ये के खातिर हम सीखे ना पानी के बहुत मुसीबत रहे द प्रोग्राम इज पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड बैंक्स न्यू ह्यूमन फेस द बैंक वांट्स टू मूव अवे फ्रॉम इट्स ट्रेडिशनल टाइप ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट इनटू सपोर्टिंग एफर्ट्स लाइक दिस द महिला समाख्य प्रोग्राम वाज स्टार्टेड इन 1989 with dutch funding but is now financed also by the world bank it is working in 1200 villages in 10 districts in karnataka gujarat and uttar pradesh its aim is to make village women literate by using innovative methods we normally work in very backward areas where no ngos are working where education levels are very poor where where communities are such that they don't uh, meet with the normal development standards which Uh, so called no normal development standards because like they say electricity or wa running water those kind of things but here those things are not then still lot of money is being pumped in in banda it has not only trained illiterate women to become hand pump mechanics but has also trained them as stone masons this has enabled them to build houses for an entire village under the indra avas scheme as a result of working they are also becoming literate and aware of their rights अरे अब ऐसे अंधी रही है पहले हां बताओ अब आई सेवरल वुमेन फ्रॉम द महिला समाख्या स्टूड फॉर इलेक्शन इन द रीसेंट पंचायत इलेक्शंस एंड वन आइरोनिकली इन रूरल उत्तर प्रदेश इट इज हरिजन एंड अदर लो कास्ट वुमेन हु आर बिकमिंग द इंजन ऑफ चेंज अपर कास्ट वुमेन स्टिल फाइंड इट हार्ड टू कम आउट ऑफ देयर होम्स इन दिस पर्टिकुलर एरिया वी आर वर्किंग इन 120 विलेजेस विद अ Um, say approximately 40 to 50 women in each village so you can multiply the amount with that like these women they they're hard up they're so they're living in a difficult terrain difficult lives but they're smiling they're like flowers and you they're not disappointed they, they're always affectionate encouraging and in themselves they have a confidence that they can surely do something the work that the mahila samakhyas are doing in uttar pradesh and in other states in india may seem like only a drop in the ocean a mere glimmer of hope but the areas in which they work are filled with so much backwardness so much darkness that even a glimmer can seem like a bright shining light that's all in this edition do join us next week at the same time 
for more stories from the world around us. Good night. <laughs>